Uh, hi, hello, welcome back to Visual Effects and Post Production. This week we are going to talk about virtual cameras. Virtual cameras are the most uh, important and most revolutionary element of the virtual cinematography. You will learn how to use their properties uh, and how to customize them in relation to the context of uh, your stories. Whatever you use Unreal or Adobe After Effects, it doesn't really matter, but it's important that you engage with both exercises so you can understand well the principles of virtual cinematography. While the modules are always designed to try to deliver uh, the production framework that you would use in a, a professional production, the truth is that there is a massive difference between uh, assignments in an academia and the real world uh, professional environments. Obviously, the most uh, clear difference is the absence of a team. You are the only person working here and therefore, you have to think about these processes as what they are, independent processes that in this case are done by the same individual. So from all the different principles of cinematography we have commented before, probably the ones uh, more related to the use of virtual cameras are camera angles and close-ups. And that is why doing this with uh, uh, After Effects and with uh, Unreal is so useful because you can actually play and change elements of the cinematography. Camera means uh, box, camera means room. Camera is just the, this space that uh, has a hole, which is the shooter, okay, or the iris if we are talking about the video camera, that uh, opens during some time and uh, during this, this brief period of time, uh, let's uh, let the, the light to come in. So using F is just a way of commenting how uh, large is the hole during that period of time. Therefore, how much light are you uh, going to get in that shot? That is what we call the depth of field. Understanding depth of field is quite uh, simple. Depth of field only refers to the amount of information that is visible before and after the, fo the focus, the object that has been focused by the camera. So in this diagram, you can see that very clear that you can maybe focus this animal, the cat probably, but Depending on the depth of field that you are using, you might be able to see as well, well focused, the uh, rabbit or even the tree that is much far away. So what is going to affect that amount of information that you can see? Well, basically the aperture. How large it is the F, okay? F stands for depth of field. So the larger the depth of field is, the larger the F is. So you can see now, it's very clear that it is inversely proportional. The larger the, sh the aperture is, the uh, shorter is the depth of field. And now it's called when everything uh, gets a little more complicated. We have other elements to take in consideration, like for example the shooter speed, uh, the aperture we have talked about, uh, the depth of field, and uh, obviously we have also the the size of the lens and the size of the sensor. So I'm not pretending you to understand all the technical details right now, but it is something that is very basic is to understand the use of depth of field at least in a narrative sense. Okay, so uh, other concepts. Uh, the focal length, okay, and the field of view. When we talk about uh, field of uh, view, we are talking in degrees. We are talking about how much we can uh, access in terms of information within this, uh, you know, uh, um, 
field of vision, okay, field of view. Okay, the focal length, it refers to the millimeters of the um, objective, okay, within our camera. So uh, the larger it is the, the, focal, uh, the focal length, it, it will be also shorter the field of view. Okay, so in that sense, they are also related in an inverse sense. So the first question is here, how much uh, field of view or which kind of focal length my camera should have? Well, as always, it depends. Okay, so the sensor size, uh, it's also sometimes um, called with different names, okay? So you have, for example, the use of extreme wide angle, wide angle, noma, tele, and tele, you know. So depending on what you want to portrait, usually there is some recommendations in relation to the features of the object and all this. But again, what you have to do is to understand what exactly uh, these uh, uh, focal length are doing on the objects you have. And remember, you are not usually uh, shooting only an object. You are shooting a group of objects, okay, and a scene. So it is not that easy to say, okay, it is a sport bird's wildlife. It might be, you know, the difference between one bird or a scene where you have different animals with a different scenario. And it obviously depends also of the amount of light you have. In this case, for example, you can see the difference in the subject, depending on the kind of focal length you are uh, using. It is basically the same shot, okay? But it changes depending on, uh, on the kind of lens you are using, okay? So obviously the most significant difference is, uh, is the size of the object in relation to the, to the general shot. So if you go to a 25, you see that the object is, is very small yet. Yeah, that is not the only difference. When you go to similar, uh, different uh, uh, lens, there will be a difference between getting a zoom to this image or getting this other uh, image. You can manipulate the zoom of a video camera, of a mobile, or uh, in the computer. But that won't be the same effect because what you do here is deforming the elements within the, the scenario, okay? And you are also getting the depth of field. So you won't get the same effect if you just go and do a zoom here. It is not the same. Let's have a look at the different terminology. Wide angles, okay? Well, you can talk about ultra wide or wide angle, and it refers usually to this kind of millimeters, okay? Between 25, uh, 35, okay, we are on that uh, uh, area or even more, which is the ultra wide angle, okay? So it would be more close to the to this idea of the 180, you know, the, the kind of the maximum of a uh, field of view. What is this good for? Okay, uh, architecture, okay, is usually good in filmmaking. Why? Well, because uh, you might be in uh, cases where you have to uh, film in real scenarios, like, for example, real buildings, uh, like historical buildings or things like that, and you don't really have a space. The space is what it is, and you are not going to modify the street, of course. So what you, you have to do is to use the, the lens that allows you to, to get the most of the scenario. Okay? What is this bad for? Well, you have... Uh, it's not the best for doing this kind of bouquet or uh, photo portraits because exaggerate is the perspective and facial features. You see that some filmmakers, for example, use that in order to create a, some kind of special effect on the face. See some possibilities related to this when you are telling a story and you have, uh, for example, in this famous uh, shot from Citizen Kane and you have even different stories, no? the, the child playing outside, the father, the mother, and the lawyer, all at the same time. Or, uh, you know, when you are uh, portraying uh, complicated scenes with a lot of people and all this.
Well, extreme uh, wide angles uh, comes to something almost visual effects. The the kind of effect it creates is is uncanny. No, if you see, uh, for example, here in this movie, uh, Wrecking for a Dream, and you you use that to uh, kind of um, express how the perception of reality is deformed by the use of different uh, drugs. So you, you see how that becomes uh, a, also a semantic tool when you use that in the context of, for example, the TV. When the, the mother is watching TV, the mother is also taking some pills, but somehow it's also the addiction to TV or the addiction to uh, all these kind of things. No? emotions and and uh, being uh, you know loved and and all this so they are different use sometimes more subtle and sometimes more explicit within the same narrative no in relation to uh, to this movie it's very common to use wide uh, angles in video games cinematography um, for example to uh, um, kind of uh, emulate First person, uh, you know, um, for example, in all kinds of first uh, person shooters, but also when you have uh, scenes that are kind of uh, uh, handheld camera and things like that. Okay, so uh, then we have the standards, okay, uh, the kind of typical camera you would use in a wedding or, you know, in a social event similar to the human eye, as we commented, and with some possibilities in relation to depth of field. That would be the extreme of the tele or the zoom. Okay, it would be uh, good to take uh, pictures of objects that are far away, but not only because of the distance, but also for the aesthetic that that uh, implements. In this case, the depth of field is, is much easier. Okay, uh, it's, it's totally the extreme from the wide angle, so in this case, more depth of field, okay? Uh, in fact, if you want to do a good portrait, you, you should start with something about 80 millimeters or more, okay? The, the problem with that is that you need to, uh, to be much, uh, much farther from the subject. You won't have that problem, obviously, in virtual cinematography because you can be as far as you want. You don't have that kind of uh, um, spatial um, limitations. So examples of that, uh, you can see that in, in video games, well, this is, is very exaggerated, the fulfill, okay? Uh, and you have here, so in, in movies and things like that, you can have uh, all those kinds of effects as well in relation to the, the fulfill. A specific kind of lens, not really very normal, would be the use of macro lens. And it would be for something very specific, like details of a product or micro photography or uh, things like that. Okay, when thinking about the um, uh, animation, we have talked about maybe this um, multiplane camera before. But basically what the um, technicians at Disney company started to experiment was with the possibility of creating the parallax effect or more, more uh, better explained to emulate the parallax effect as it uh, happens in uh, current conditions. The way we perceive uh, uh, usually uh, backgrounds and different layers due to our two eyes is usually different depending on the information that comes from one eye or another. That creates what we call a parallax effect. That means that uh, not all objects would move at the same speed when we are moving horizontally from them. In order to emulate this effect, uh, Disney experimented with this multiplane camera. Okay, depending on the distance of uh, the different layers and the kind of lens used, you can emulate different effects and you can create more realistic and immersive uh, portraits. Okay. In relation to After Effects, uh, we can see focal length. Okay. Uh, basically, that would affect our field of view. Uh, basically, the units, you can work with different kinds of units. Uh, the aperture, 
okay, in terms of uh, what is going to be uh, the maximum aperture. Uh, the f-stop, okay, using f-stops as uh, you might have seen already, uh, you can determine or expect some kind of uh, depth of field. The blur level is a property that you won't find in real cameras, well, unless it has some kind of uh, uh, engine for, uh, you know, post-production in, in the same camera. But it's not really uh, a usual feature, and this would be to simulate that uh, swallow effect uh, without uh, touching the parameters of F. Problem is if you touch F, you, you might have so much light. So obviously that, that is something to consider. The point of interest is the point you are focusing. So you can imagine that now it would be a question of allocating in the virtual space the different objects and uh, setting up where are we going to focus, okay? If we are going to use the fulfill or not, okay? And adjust the parameters of the camera. Depending on the parameters of the camera, there would be an interpretation of the parameters uh, from the light, okay? So obviously, camera cannot be isolated from light. However, we are seeing light in another uh, session. So as commented, light is something you have to uh, uh, see in the next lesson because it requires really a whole week of work. But uh, it is important to know at least at this point that uh, you have uh, parallel spots or point light, okay? And therefore, the camera can cast shadows or not, uh, can, uh, you know, be affected by the light setting. When talking about 3D environments, uh, in terms like, for example, uh, game engines, uh, the cameras are uh, also working as actors. It means that whatever we are in After Effects or in Unreal, we can also move the camera. The camera has a position and the camera can have a movement. Just to clarify, maybe the main difference between Unreal and uh, After Effects in relation to the use of cameras and the use of light is that in uh, uh, Unreal you have to think carefully about the use of materials. Actually, you have also materials, shadows and kinds of light in After Effects. So it is not that different in, in that sense. The difference is that in Unreal, uh, you might uh, need to work with the different nodes. So you have this system of nodes to create uh, uh, different new materials, combination of textures and different behaviors like, uh, uh, you know, diffusion or uh, uh, metalness or uh, things like that. This is just an example of how the same texture, depending on uh, the properties of the material, might be, uh, you know, offering a very different result. And that is something that you have to take in consideration when using uh, other elements of virtual cinematography, like, for example, uh, cameras. For those that want to start from zero, I would recommend that tutorial about using third-person uh, templates and just uh, swapping cameras. I already uploaded to uh, the canvas. The properties of the uh, virtual camera is something we are going to see in the laboratory are also quite advanced and you have also what you call post-production effects. So you have elements like uh, color or uh, like uh, noise that can be uh, modified on the camera but are not really depending on the uh, uh, light setting or uh, on the objects on the screen. And that's all uh, for today. Uh, I hope this uh, is a useful uh, introduction to the topic of the virtual cameras. And uh, now is the moment that you uh, start working on your different projects uh, and the exercise uh, for this week. You have exercise on Unreal and you have exercise on After Effects. My advice is that when you are confident about the use of After Effects, uh, you can uh, start your animatics. Uh, animatic is not a piece that is mandatory, but I think it's very useful in order to preview uh, the result and the rhythm, the pace of your, of your project. 
So I think it could be very useful. You can do animatics as well using uh, directly the Unreal, but it might be uh, very similar to what you are going to do finally. So it might be worthy to just start working with After Effects and do it faster. And next week we'll see the light, so everything would start to uh, to make a little more sense. Some option optional. Some optional activities for this week. Uh, as always, uh, I propose here some things like, for example, reviewing examples of virtual cinematography. We'll talk about this on discussions as well. Uh, right now, for example, is uh, very popular the series of Star Wars uh, The Mandalorian, which is using Unreal as well. Have a look at tools that can help to um, uh, simulate the of field or help you to choose the most appropriate tool in terms of light or in terms of focus or in terms of lens, all these things. Like, for example, this uh, focal length calculator. Other resources can be uh, helpful if you are interested in learning more about uh, digital cinematography. And of course, uh, the reading list related to this section of the module. That's all for today and uh, see you in the lab. Take care.